Hello, my name is Ian Cranston. I'm a diabetes physician based in Portsmouth on the South Coast. I have a background in clinical research looking into issues around impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. And for the last 20 years or so, I've been undertaking clinical practice in an effort to try and introduce some of the lessons we learnt in that research period into routine clinical care and further trying to educate both colleagues in the healthcare professional field, but also patients uh, treated with insulin, how they can best avoid problems with hypoglycemia. For the last five years or so, we've been able to use uh, continuous glucose monitoring, such as Freestyle Libre, in our clinical practice. And I think this has really highlighted some of the lessons that we've picked up around probably one of the most key features around avoiding hypoglycemia problems, which is glucose variability. So what I'd like to do today is talk about what we mean when we talk about glucose variability and what causes it, how one can identify glucose variability, and of course, in the long term, how we can help to try and reduce that variability to improve outcomes. So, Traditionally, we've thought a lot about glucose control in terms of trying to reduce the overall average of glucose levels with measures such as the haemoglobin A1c. And indeed, our goals of care have often been to try and reduce this average to ensure that we minimise an individual's exposure to excess glucose levels, which we know can cause problems for blood vessels. However, if we make this reduction of average the only focus of our care, we know that that can lead to problems by the generation of hypoglycemia. If the differences in an individual's glucose levels from one day to the next, which we term glucose variability, aren't also addressed alongside. So in this panel, we have four individuals and their glucose profiles over a two week period collected with the Freestyle Libre sensor. Each pair, the top pair and the bottom pair, have got a similar haemoglobin A1c. But we can see that the overall glucose experience of the individuals represented by each panel is really very different. Those on the left hand side of this graph show clearly much less glucose variability from one day to the next than do those on the right. And although their average of control is the same, it's clear that for any of us choosing what we would like our control to be, we would choose those with the least variability. So whilst the average of glucose levels is certainly important, and we know that this is something that builds up to our overall risk over time, we have to recognise that the glucose control of an individual is much more than just that haemoglobin A1c average. And so we need to take into account measures of glucose change or glucose flux, if you like. And these measures naturally fall into two categories. The first category is glucose flux that happens in an individual day, which we tend to term glucose instability. And in the graph on the left hand side of the panel here, we can see that this individual has a very significantly rising glucose level after his evening meal, which then creeps up over the course of the night. By contrast, the other form of glucose flux that we see is the flux that happens between days. So the profile of an individual day on the left, if it's repeated but with a different form of instability each day, can produce this much larger profile on the right, and it's this variability between the days that causes so much problems from a clinical perspective. And indeed, I would go further than that to say, because we know that it's these flux measures that actually are the sole target and the treatment requirement to avoid hypoglycemia. So this is that same panel slightly enlarged, so we can see it. And the challenge is, we can clearly see that every day in this profile is slightly different. The challenge, of course, is for us to look at this as a single image is very confusing and indeed slightly overwhelming, both to people with diabetes and, of course, to their healthcare professionals trying to help. 
And so if we are to use these measures of glucose variability effectively, we need to have a different way of looking at them. And that's exactly what's happened by the use of this thing called the ambulatory glucose profile, which in the Libre's own software they call their daily patterns view, which allows us to see multiple days as a much simpler figure. What this panel represents is a dark blue line, which is the median glucose level over the period of the sensor wear. So the median means that half of the values are above, half of the values are below. The dark blue shaded area is bounded by two other lines. One is the what we call the 25th percentile underneath the median and one is the 75th percentile. So that between those two dark blue lines, we can see a half of the individual's entire glucose experience over the period of the time that the sensor was worn. The light blue shaded areas represent both the 10th and the 90th percentile respectively. So in other words, 80% of this person's overall glucose experience. And in this way, we have a much more detailed picture of exactly what this individual has undergone through the course of the sensor wear. The highest and the lowest 10% of an individual's glucose experience are omitted from this picture, which is a quite deliberate act because what we're trying to use this for is to look at bigger patterns rather than individual days. And so what we take from that is that the highest and lowest 10% mark, if you like, extremes of an individual's experience and therefore things that are relatively unlikely to be repeated. So, we've talked about variability, we've talked about exposure in terms of haemoglobin A1c. On this figure, what do those two things look like? So, effectively, the haemoglobin A1c, or the average glucose level, is shown on this figure by the area underneath the median line and the two mathematically are virtually identical in that respect. The way we see variability on this picture is slightly different, and the way we see variability is actually how wide the profile is at any given particular time of day. So on this uh, figure, what we're seeing is the half of the individual's experience, and therefore, if you like, it might be described as the usual level of variability that this person experienced at particular times of day. And we can see that that is different at different times of the day. But of course, we also can see a much wider pattern of variability, which relates to the 80% experience. And if you like, the difference between those two being what usually happens on a given time of day versus what sometimes happens at that time of day. And determining the difference between those two things is an important part in us trying to address them for the future. So. What we have here on this slide is four different profiles from different people. And we can see that the profiles can look very, very different from one person to another. Top left, we have an individual who doesn't have diabetes. And we can see that for this individual, the whole of the glucose experience when averaged out according to these interquartile and interdecile ranges is virtually a flat line. Bottom left, we have what we were, if you like, we might be aiming for, for an individual's glucose control over time, who's using treatments to manage diabetes. And we can see that it remains quite flat. It's not as narrow as the individual without diabetes. And the overall position of the line on the graph is slightly higher than that is for someone without diabetes. But this still reflects good control. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. On the right hand side of this uh, slide, we can see two different patterns of individuals who have far more variable glucose levels. And again, I've chosen two patterns deliberately, the top and the bottom panel on the right side here, that show people with very similar hemoglobin A1Cs, but very different patterns of glucose variability, which are immediately discernible on this profile. So, we know that the overall variability from day to day results from a different pattern of instability occurring each day in someone's experience. So one of the things that we need to look at, and you'll see in many of the series uh, of, the, of this videos, is what could cause those instability differences on different days. And of course, we have here two days where we can see the pattern of glucose on those two days is almost the reciprocal of each other. 
for a, the same person. And we have to then ask ourselves, well, why is that pattern different on the two days? When we look at the two days in more detail, and you'll see these in more detail in one of the other modules in this series, we can see that it's the same sort of decision making that is available on both days, overcorrecting high glucose levels, overtreating low glucose levels, meals without insulin, etc., etc. The key, however, is the reason that the pattern is different on the two days is that those things are happening at different times on the two days. So the thing that drives variability is the difference between the decision making on the two days. If decisions are always perfect, it doesn't matter that they're happening at different times of day. If the decisions are, however, less than perfect, then the time of day at which they're happening makes a difference. And of course, there are many, many causes of glucose fluctuation that may happen on an individual day. This is just a short list of those. And again, I think you'll look at these in more detail in some of the other modules in this series. So that difference from one day to the next, how is that easiest assessed? And of course, long term with the goal of trying to reduce that variability. Effectively, a plan that needs to be made. Although on an individual day trace, you can see instability, to see variability, you need to be looking at a trace for many days. And we normally would recommend a two week period from this perspective. And the easiest way to do that is to use the um, display that is known as the daily patterns display or the ambulatory glucose profile. And the logical time, at least in my view, to do that is in the gap between two periods of sensor wear in that hour warm up period before the sensor picks up again. It's easiest to look at it not on a phone screen or a um, reader screen, but to look at it on either a tablet or a PC so that we can see more of the information and in uh, more detail. And the important thing isn't to think about the numbers but it's to look at the overall picture on that daily patterns profile. And when you're looking at that picture, there's a series of questions that you can ask yourself. The first being, how does this profile compare towards what I would like to have as an ideal? And if there isn't ideal, which parts of the day show the most difference from that ideal? Having decided which parts of the day are important, it's then to ask, what decisions do I make at that time of day? What is going on at that time of day that drives the variability? And then to make a plan to say, what will I do differently for the next two weeks than I did the last two weeks to try and impact upon that? And in that series of two week profiles, one can slowly but surely work towards reduced variability. And of course, this is something that we would hope and expect that your healthcare professional will be able to help you with in conversation as part of that consultation process. So this is a reminder of that profile that we're aiming for. And effectively, what we're seeing on this profile is that almost the entirety of the blue profile is fitting in a target range between four and 10 millimoles per litre. And of course, the absolute requirement if it is fitting within four and 10 millimoles per litre is that there can't be too much variability or day to day instability for that to be true. So this is also one of the profiles you saw earlier on, and this is an individual and the profile clearly isn't fitting in that four to 10 target. So how does the picture need to change in order that it could fit? Because what's clear is we can't just push down this profile because it will produce hypoglycemia. And I think this gives us an important insight into the way that we can manage diabetes more effectively. So the first step in trying to make it fit is to reduce the variability. In this particular case, the vast majority of the width of the profile is produced by that sometimes light blue part of the profile, which usually means that an individual's behaviours from one day to the next are quite different. And it's a case of analysing which parts of those behaviours are causing the day to day differences.
but having reduced variability, this profile will still not fit in a 4 to 10 target group. And in order to do that, we now need to try and flatten the profile. And of course, flattening the profile means balancing up mismatches between parts of the day when there is too little insulin and parts of the day when there may be too much insulin. Once we produce a profile that is narrower and flatter, the job of getting it then down into the target box is actually relatively straightforward. And for most people who have type 1 diabetes, the step 3 is actually not required. Because if you address steps 1 and 2, step 3 happens automatically. So I'd like to give you an example of that process to finish with, um, who's a gentleman from my uh, clinic who I saw some time ago now. He's a 44 year old man who's had type 1 diabetes for nearly 30 years, sorry just over 30 years. Uh, his haemoglobin A1c has generally run along in the range between 7.5 and 8.5. And and so not perfect but actually pretty good. Most recently 8.3%. He uses uh, a multiple daily dose insulin, he uses Lantus as his background insulin and Humalog as his mealtime insulin. He's uh, what I call a Daphne graduate in that he has done carbohydrate counting and he's been on the Daphne course to learn how to use his insulin to best effect. And that insulin use is effectively is about 28 units of Lantus in a day and an insulin to carbs ratio of one unit for 10 grams, an insulin sensitivity factor of one unit for three millimoles to correct. On average, he's using somewhere between 50 and 55 units of insulin a day. So the first time he wore a sensor, this is the profile that he achieved. And what we can see from this profile is that actually it's very close to what we would expect his profile to be from his haemoglobin A1c. How do we look at this profile? It clearly differs across different parts of the day. Some parts of the day have greater variability, some parts have less variability. I think for the purposes of this gentleman, it's easiest to look at it through his normal working day. So when he wakes in the morning, Actually, the profile is quite narrow, and for vast majority of his waking sugar levels are exactly at the target he'd like them to be. We can see that through the course of the next few hours, the profile remains quite narrow, so variability is low, but fairly consistently with a rising glucose level. For the remainder of his day, what we can see is that the profile from about um, mid to late morning onwards becomes much wider and is running slightly higher than it was when he woke up. The width here relates to the actions and reactions that he's creating, trying to address those slightly higher than uh, fasting glucose levels. And of course, the correction elements that he takes will vary from one day to the next, depending on when he's looked at the data. Once he goes to bed and goes to sleep again, what we can see is that the variability overnight slowly but surely reduces. So one could conclude from this profile that if his sugar levels didn't rise across the first few hours of the morning, he wouldn't have a need to correct during the uh, later morning and afternoon, and therefore his variability would remain quite low for that part of the day. So the action derived from this would therefore be to increase his insulin to carbohydrate ratio at his breakfast meal, and just that action. And indeed, that's exactly the action we took when we discussed this profile with him after his first two weeks of wear. He came back a month later, and we can see that his profile looks quite different now. The only change that has been made between these two profiles is that he now takes a 1.3 uh, units for every 10 grams uh, insulin to carb ratio for his breakfast. He still uses one for 10, he still uses 28 units of Lantus in the background. And what we can see almost straight away is that this profile has now become nearly an ideal profile. And indeed, he was extremely happy with this and decided to make no further changes. And I'm pleased to say, uh, on his behalf anyway, that his profile really now hasn't changed over the last two years. So he has an at-target profile almost all the time. Now, that won't happen for everybody in one step as it has here. 
but I think it's an important descriptor of the fact that sometimes the changes that are needed can be really quite small changes to have a big impact upon the overall glucose experience. So in summary, glucose variability, the difference between one day and the next, is important because it gets in the way of us achieving overall glucose related goals. Those who have high variability will have a higher hypoglycemia risk and therefore reducing variability is most often the first step towards improving overall control. The way to see variability from a, from a sensor is to use the daily patterns profile or ambulatory glucose profile as it's also known. And it sh I think is a good habit to make to try and look at this at the end of each period of sensor wear. And at the end of each sensor to look at the one change that you might wish to make in advance of the next time that you're looking at the same profile. And of course, if things aren't progressing, that's hopefully where your healthcare professional can come in and help. Thanks very much for your attention.